When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my life, they say young men don't know hymns, but thou hast taught me to say. Help me sing it, y'all. It is well with, with my soul. And the church say, yeah. Yeah. just do me a favor and begin to give God a praise in here. I know we're at a home going service but God is still oh he's still on the throne Amen. yes he is he's still on the throne Nothing catches God by surprise. Giving honor to the Spirit of Christ, who is indeed the head of my life, to the pastor of this church, Mr. Holt, to the pulpit, ministers, and to those that may be in the audience, and to all of you, the Heavenly Father's children. I have a statement I make at my church in Atlanta that I serve as the overseer of. I say, I'm not going to preach long, but I'm going to preach strong. I'll be quite honest with you, this is a very challenging task for me this morning because Kevin was my brother. I'm not talking about made up brother, play brother. Kevin was my blood brother. Kevin and I shared the same father. Many of you know my dad, Pastor Ferris Long Sr. I had the honor and the privilege and the task of serving as the eulogist at my father's homegoing celebration. And while we were at the hospital, when, when Kevin was uh, laying there in the hospital, I came down from Tennessee because they had made the decision that he, had, he was going to be taken off of life support. And I asked my nephew, Ashley, I said, you need me, nephew? And Ashley said, yeah, Unc, I need you. It was snowing that Saturday morning, and I still made up my mind I was going to get to Athens, Georgia, to be with my family. Even in the passing of my brother, and even at the time he was still alive, God gave me an extra blessing in my life by the fact that even though 
we shared the same father, we didn't share the same mother, but I thank God that Mama Ruby has become a mother to me. Chandra, Deborah, they accepted me. And in situations like today, folk don't have to accept you. But they accepted me as their little brother, as if I was their own blood. So for that, I am grateful and I give honor to God for my new family. I also want to say thank God for the long side of the family, which is here today supporting the whole family as a whole and supporting me and honoring their nephew, their cousin, my brother. You know, I've only been on this earth for 38 years. And I want to go to 2 Samuel. I'm going to read very quickly from the message version of the Bible. 2 Samuel chapter 12. And for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and begin reading down at verse number 15. It says, after Nathan went home, God afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David. And he came down sick. David prayed desperately to God for the little boy. He fasted. He wouldn't go out. And he slept on the floor. The elders in his family came in and tried to get him off the floor, but he wouldn't budge. Nor could they get him to eat anything. On the seventh day, the child died. David's servants were afraid to tell him. They said, what do we do now? While the child was living, he wouldn't listen to a word we said. Now with the child dead, if we speak to him, there's no telling what he will do. David noticed that the servants were whispering behind his back and realized that the boy must have died. He asked the servants, is the boy dead? Yes, they answered, he's dead. David got up from the floor, washed his face, combed his hair, put on a fresh change of clothes, then went to the sanctuary to worship. <laughs> Glory. Then he came home and asked for something to eat. They set it before him and he ate. His servants asked him, what's going on with you? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept and stayed up all night. Now that he's dead, you get up and eat. David said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept, thinking God might have mercy on me and the child would live. But now that he's dead, why fast? Can I bring him back now? I can go to him, but he can't come to me. May the Lord bless the hearers, the readers, and the doers of his word. To share with you from a thought this morning, I want to share with you, what do I do now? What do I do now? You know... Like I said, I've only been on the earth for 38 years. And in my 38 years of being here on this earth, I have found out that in life there are very few absolutes. Now, I know I'm preaching a homegoing service, but I came here, I can't preach Kevin's life. Kevin has already lived his life. My job today is to preach to those of us who are alive and remain. And one thing I found out in my short 38 years of living, I don't claim to know everything, but I have learned a few things. One of the absolutes of life is that if you live long enough, one of these old days, you will pass this way. One thing you have to understand about that is the fact that who you serve on this side is who you'll see on the other side. Heard the old song say, be very sure 
be very sure that your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In case you're wondering, the rock is Jesus. I may not, I, I know I'm in a Baptist sanctuary. I may not get to it at the end, so I'm going to go ahead and say it now. The same Jesus who died on the cross. See, when I grew up in the Baptist church, they said you didn't preach unless you took him to the cross. So I'm going to go ahead and give it to you right now. The same Jesus that died on the cross and rose on the third day. Be sure that your anchor holds and grips that rock. But I found out, y'all, that there's another absolute. Help me preach, Holy Ghost. The other, one other absolute in life is that you will experience loss. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you come from. I don't care what side of the track you grew up on. You will experience loss. Loss is not limited to the passing of a loved one. Some of us sitting in here, you may have gone through a divorce. You were living and loving and being with that person for 10, 12, 15 years, and all of a sudden, they made the announcement, I can't do this anymore. They leave you with all the children, the dog, and the debt. And you're saying, Lord, I don't know what to do. You may have been working on that job, and while you've been on that job for 5, 10, 15 years, all of a sudden they walk in the door one day, they said, I need to see you in the office, and they tell you, thank you for your service, but we've got to bid you farewell. It may be that you were coming in late because sometimes some loss is our fault. I don't have a talk back church. <laughs> Most of the time people don't want to be honest with ourselves and say that some losses are our own fault. We want to blame it on everybody else but we have to take responsibility for the things that are our fault. So sometimes in loss you will deal with something called regret. You will look back at your life and think about all the wouldas, the couldas, and the shoulda. I know there's somebody in here who said, if I only had not messed with that one right there, if I had left that booger right there alone, maybe my life would have been better. Lord, I wish I had never met her. Wish I had never met him. But let me just encourage you right now, you wouldn't be where you are and who you are if you had not met them and went through whatever you went through with them. But please, you know, please understand that the fact that you're still here is proof that God has not left you. So we all deal with losses and no matter what kind of loss you have dealt with or may be dealing with in here right now. I come to let you know that all of us have one commonality. When we deal with loss, we all end up with one question. What do I do now? <laughs> what do I do now? Well, as I hasten to my close, I'm going to share four things with you to help you that come from this passage of scripture that I just read that will help you figure out what to do now. Because one thing I figured out, y'all, is some of us are in three, there's three different phases you can be in. You can be going into a storm, you can be in the middle of a storm, or you can be coming So my message today is to speak to you no matter where you are in the process. Yeah. Whether you're in it, whether you're going in it, whether you're in the middle of it, or whether you're coming out of it, you still have to ask the question, what do I do now? Well, my first point today, your very first thing that you've got to do is bow down. 
bow down. When you look at David and David is there, his child had gotten sick and he was, they, they didn't know whether the child was going to live or die. As a matter of fact, the prophet had pronounced that the child was going to die. But David got down on his face and he began to fast and he began to pray and he said, maybe God will have mercy on me. Now, why is that significant? Because I need you to understand today that when David was there and he was on that floor, it was a sign that he still had hope. Doesn't matter what you're in, doesn't matter what you're facing right now. I remember being at the hospital and when they took Kevin off of the life support, Kevin was breathing strong and his vitals stayed strong for a while. And we sat there in the room and we said, maybe there's just a little bit of hope. We prayed, we trusted God, we believed God with all of our heart. That meant that we had hope. I come to tell somebody today that you, my, all you may have left is hope. But if you've got hope, you can keep on living. So my first point is you've got to learn how to bow down. Dear God. But in your learning how to bow down, my second point is look up. Bow down. Look up. Uh, the scriptures have declared, I will lift up my eyes <laughs> to the hills from which cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord, the Lord which made heaven and earth. Let me just help you right here. Sometimes you may have a moment where you're not only bowed down, but you find your head looking down. Let me just tell you, I was on my way here this morning, and God told me to tell somebody. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I'm going to preach to at least one person. God told me to tell somebody today that the only time you should be looking down is when you're bowing your head in reverence to him. Wait a minute. And not just when you're bowing your head in reverence, but when you're looking down at the devil and reminding him and yourself that he's under your feet. You got to keep in your mind that the devil is always under your feet. Woo. So what you going to do? I'm going to look up. The Bible has declared looking unto Jesus. Oh, I can't hear nobody talk back to me in here. Who is the author and the finisher of my faith. Anybody got just a little bit of faith up in here? He that has begun a good work in me will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I thank God that he's the author and the finisher. I can't even take credit for it on my own, but I am grateful for faith. So point number one was bow down. Point number two was look up. But now after you've bowed down and you've submitted, watch this, you've got to learn how to submit to the will of God. Mama Ruby, you may not always understand why things are the way they are. Why did Kevin have to go now? Actually, why did, why did Dad have to go now? Why, Chandra, did he, why, Deborah, did he have to go now? And why? But we don't have the answer to that question. But even if you don't have the answer, you've got to position yourself to say, God is still in control. I remember my Baptist roots when they would say God is too wise <laughs> to make a mistake. I'm not blaming Kevin's untimely death on God, but I'm going to tell you this. God was not caught by surprise. <laughs> so once you've bowed down and once you've looked up, the Bible declares that David was on that floor and they couldn't get him to move. He was hurting. Because his baby was hanging between life and death. Woo. His baby was there. He didn't know what was going to happen next. And he fasted and he prayed. But the Bible said after seven days. Mm, after seven days, the Bible declares that the baby died. 
They didn't know what to say to him. Have you ever been in a position where you see somebody who's hurting, somebody who's grieving, somebody who's heart's broken, and you don't even know what words to say? Let me just help you. Sometimes you don't have to say anything at all. Just the fact that you're sitting there with them is enough to give them strength to go on. I don't know, but, you know, sometimes we feel like we got to have something to say. Listen, you don't have all the answers. Sometimes you just need to be quiet. So the baby died. And the Bible said when the baby died, David saw them whispering. He said, oh, so the baby's dead? They said, yeah, he's dead. My point number three is I hasten to my close. Point number three is that once you've bowed down and once you've looked up, it gives you the strength to get up. <laughs> see, it's what you do. See, 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 David was not just experienced with bowing down on his face just when the baby got sick. I wish I had some help in here this morning. He was not just affiliated with bowing down and getting on his face when the baby was sick because he's the same man that wrote, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not. So he had a relationship with God before the bad thing ever happened. I come to encourage you today that if you don't have a relationship with God, that's the one thing that you need because if you need the strength to get up, you got to know the hand that's going to help you up. Father, I stretch glory my hands to thee. No other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, where shall I go? Where am I going to go? What am I going to do if I don't have your hand to help me, God? So you got to have relationship before the trial. Don't wait till you get in it to start praying. Don't wait till your tears are falling before you start crying out. Call unto him while he is near. His bowing down gave him the strength to be able to get up. So the Bible declares that David got up and he washed his face and he changed his clothes. I come to tell you, family, we might be wearing black today, but you won't always be wearing black tomorrow. I come to let you know you've got to make a decision that through it all, I'm going to learn from the things that Kevin put into my life. I'm going to learn from the things that he deposited. I'm going to learn from the memories I have of Kevin, and I'm going to keep it moving. I'm going to get up. Yeah, it's normal for us to experience grief. It's normal for people when you're going through something in your life to deal with grief from the loss. But I come to let you know today, you can't stay there. Don't let depression, don't let grief, don't let what happened to you hold you where you are. There's so much more for you to live for. And then, once you get the strength to get up, my last point is you got to be ready to move forward. Bow down. Look up. Get up. And now move forward. As I close today, I come to tell you there was a man by the name of Horatio Spafford. Y'all can help me close if you want to, musicians. Ah, but he was an attorney by trade. And Horatio Spafford was, uh, he was, he was taking his family, he was an investor, and he invested in some real estate in Chicago. Uh, and the story goes that when he invested in the real estate in Chicago, the great fire of Chicago came and burned it all away. Yes, and I hear that he, he told his family they were going through so much and they were hurting and they were broken and they were dealing with the pain of the loss. Uh, and I come to let you know that when they, he told them, he said, family, I'm going to send you on vacation. And when he got ready to send them on vacation, he sent them on a ship. 
over towards Europe. His wife and his four daughters were on the ship uh, on their way across to Europe. And the story goes that while they were in the water, that they were struck by an iron ship. And, and the ship sank within 12 minutes. The story goes that the wife was the only one or one of the few people that escaped. But all four of his daughters died. Oh, Lord, and while his four daughters drowned in the middle of the sea, they said that this man was on the ship on his way out there to where his family had been. He was on his way to go see about his wife. And the story goes that when he got out there, he got in the place where the ship had, had sunk. But when he got there, there was a peace that came upon him. The Bible said that God will give you peace that passes all your understanding. He had just lost four children in the middle of the ocean. But yet when he got there to the place where they had drowned, something came over him and he said, when peace like a river, I'll attend if my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever, y'all, I'm sorry, I feel like preaching. Whatever, doesn't matter what comes. It doesn't matter what goes. Whatever, my Lord, thou has taught me to say, it is well. Do I have some help in here? It is well. Doesn't matter what you're facing right now. Do you have the faith to say it is well? well with my soul so as i close now the question becomes what do i do now i heard david say i will i wish i had a church right there i will i will bless the lord at all times his praise shall continually be in my mouth my soul will make her boast in the Lord. The humble will hear thereof and be glad. In the midst of my hell, I will magnify the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us, family, we're crying right now, but let us exalt his name together. Let us, if you can't help me, Please don't stop me. What do I do now? I'm going to enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Enter into his courts with praise. I'm going to be faithful unto him and bless his name. Say yeah. Yeah. What you gonna do, Lord? I'm gonna give him praise in the midst of my hell, in the midst of my tears, in the midst of my crying. I will, oh, I will. Yes, I will. Lift up your head, all ye gates. Be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the key. Wow, the king. I'm done, y'all, but listen. 
I don't know, I don't ever want to close a service like this without offering somebody the opportunity to come to know Jesus. I can't let my brother's life and his passing be in vain. If you're in here and you don't have a relationship with God and you need to come to know Jesus in the power of his resurrection and the fact that he is Savior and Lord, I want you to lift your hand right now. Don't be ashamed. If you're a backslider, you were once walking with Christ, but you've backslidden. We're not going to.